I'd like to introduce to you the heroes of the front line that you may not see as heroes of the front line. Almost 10 years, almost 10 years ago, seven-month-old Matea died when her concerned mother's pleas were dismissed. They did not receive disclosure. It was an unknown entity at the time. The silence and the lack of accountability was more destructive than the fact of their daughter's death. This is Jess. You heard her story yesterday. This vibrant, or maybe not yesterday, the day before. This vibrant, beautiful 17-year-old died due to misdiagnosis. The information her parents provided as a potential cause for her symptoms were dismissed. Numerous requests to the physicians and the organization were ignored. The family just wanted answers and assurance that this would not happen to another person and family. This is baby Annie. She died at 80 days old. A DNR was placed on her chart without her parents' knowledge or permission. The organization and providers closed ranks and the silence continued. Our 19-year-old son, Vance, died when his injury was not taken seriously. He did not receive the care that would have given him the best chance of survival. My concerns fell on deaf ears. The silence we encountered as his condition deteriorated to brain death was deafening. The only person to approach us was the coroner who listened to what had happened. The devastation of his unexpected death was compounded when we got no answers or acknowledgement that something significant had happened. It was one day before the sixth anniversary of his death that a conversation with the organization took place. This is Martha, who was a 22-year-old promising nursing student. Inappropriately prescribed medication was responsible for her death. Those that cared for her remained silent and those who examined her death tried to cover up the truth. It was the family who did the investigation that uncovered the facts of what had happened. It took eight years for the coroner's office to write a letter of apology for their part. It has been four years since CAPCA encountered the medical system and had surgery that resulted in debilitating effects. The refusal by the surgeon to discuss it was it compounded the harm. After surgery in another country to correct the, the first surgery, the, they, the family tried to go and ask for meetings with the doctors and the organization again. However, they haven't had that conversation. 80-year-old Ambrose died after a fall when he was weak and ill from recent surgery. The meetings with the hospital was less than satisfactory, with no assurances that the improvements would be put into place to prevent a similar incident. The common theme with all of these cases is the silence that followed the incidents, the lack of disclosure. In many cases, the families or patients had to make the first move. Without fail, all of these families and the patients they wanted acknowledgement of what had happened. They wanted to know that things were going to be put in place to make sure it didn't happen to another family. They knew that it was crucial to partner with the health system to give their perspective of what was needed after a patient safety incident. How could the health care system know what was needed in disclosure? We didn't even know as families what was needed until we experienced it. And now that we have been through it, we can help the healthcare system to understand what the needs are and what, is, what action needs to be taken. In Hands in Healthcare, a magazine that CPSI puts out at this time of year, Jim Goche, an infection control practitioner um, at Kingston, he says we can learn a lot from patients. And indeed, we can. Learning from the errors is the only way the patient safety agenda can move forward. To learn from the errors, there first must be acceptance that something went wrong. You cannot fix what is not acknowledged. It is not easy, but it is absolutely necessary. Patients and families need the acknowledgement and the accountability. Patients and families see things that busy health providers do not see. We have a unique perspective because of the experience we are going through. Experience is a great teacher.
Carolyn Hoffman, the VP of Quality Improvement and Healthcare Improvement at Alberta Health Services, says if you want to improve, you must listen. And I believe you must also engage patients and families. The Canadian Disclosure Guidelines were first developed in 2008, and in 2011 they already had to be revised because it's a living, breathing document that changes as the landscape of patient safety changes in our country and across the world. And the patient and family voice at that table, at all of the conversations, um, imparting that really, really important knowledge and experience that they have lived, made this document stronger and more reflective of what patients and families need. Patients and families, first, uh, pardon me, uh, is very rarely that financial consideration is the focus of patient and families after a harmful incident. In fact, when a fatality has occurred or severe loss, you know, there is no amount of money that could equate to our our loved one's life or the loss that they've had of a bodily part or how they used to live. Um, it's almost an insult to suggest that we want money because that is not the main thing. No amount of money could equal my son's life. When the organization is responsible though or has accountability for the event and when there is debilitating loss that affects a person's life, compensation indeed should be considered. Acknowledgement, accountability, apology, honesty, transparency, timely sharing of information and partnership. This is what you're going to learn in the Patients for Patient Safety Canada disclosure principles that are available at our website. They were written by patients and families who have experienced the harm. They are written from the heart of these patients and families who know what is needed after a patient safety incident. We just want to make sure it never happens to anyone else or to any other family. That is why we seek answers and this is why we do the work we do, partnering with the healthcare system and telling our stories. Our stories have been shared at medical and nursing schools, at conferences, on YouTube, and they're used nationally and internationally. Many of us could talk on this subject of disclosure for days. We want to partner and we have a wealth of knowledge to share. If healthcare does not learn from the patient safety incidents, it is inexcusable, as Sir Liam says. If every resource is not used to make improvements, such as hearing and en engaging patients and families, it is irresponsible. Not only the patients and families suffer, the providers do too. The analysis of a patient safety incident is not complete until all the perspectives of the incidents are known, and that includes the patient and family. They may not know the questions to ask. Instead, offer them to tell the story in their words. It can change the conversation and the direction that the analysis takes. We found this out when we had our conversation six years after Vance died. Those providers learned things that they did not know had happened six years previous. Through those of us at Patients for Patient Safety Canada, our loved ones' voices live on. We honour them every day. We have to do this work to make sure no other patients and families suffer as we have. The good news is that the culture is changing and that is evidenced by conferences such as this and by the conversations we are now having. Um, we hear from patients and families that there is a new attitude out there, but there is a lot of work yet to be done because a lot of that is in silos. As Tilda said in the first session this morning, many things go right and improvements have been made. And it is reassuring and inspire, inspiring to hear her talk of the nurse who said that she promised her, her patient safe and efficient care. I'd like to read for you right now a poem that one of our members wrote, The Door. Knocking, I stand outside. Six years I've stood, six years I've waited, and I cannot leave her now, voiceless and unheard. I cannot fail her, I cannot let her fail. So here I stand, and stand until. I knocked and waited, like all the yesterdays, until wide-eyed I am ushered in. 
As I cross the threshold, I wonder, had perseverance won or did resignation reign? Perhaps a little bit of both, but who cares? Right now, I am in. We gather at their table, inclusion folding us within its warm embrace, two needed parts of a greater whole. And now, no longer without a voice, she who speaks, speaks through me, is finally honoured well. And as for me, I gently smile, lay down my head, and weep. From the hearts of those who have been harmed, from the hearts of us left behind, to be the voice for those who will no longer have a voice, for those who will seek care in the future and perhaps be harmed, open the door when you go back to your organizations, your facilities, your work. This is the torch we pass to you today. In fact, it's the torch we've been passing all week. Be the champion to open the door so that every patient will be safe. And if harm does happen, open the door and your heart to see to the needs of the patient and or the loved ones that are left behind. Open the door and let us in to help you find a better way. Thank you.